The Getting of Wisdom by Henry Handel Richardson Dedication to my unnamed little collaborator. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting get understanding. Proverbs 4, verse 7 Chapter 19 Thus Laura went to Coventry. Not that the social banishment she now suffered was known by that name. To the majority of the girls, Coventry was just a word in the geography book, a place where ribbons were said to be made, and where, for a better red few, someone had hung with grooms and porters on a bridge. This detail, odd to say, making a deeper impression on their young minds than the story of Lady Godiva, which was looked upon merely as a naughty anecdote. But, by whatever name it was known, Laura's ostracism was complete. She had been sampled, tested, put on one side, and not the softest-hearted could find an excuse for her behavior. It is but another instance of how misfortune dogs him who is down, that Chinky should choose this very moment to bring further shame upon her. On one of the miserable days that were now the rule, when Laura would have liked best to be a rabbit, hid deep in its burrow, as she was going upstairs one afternoon, she met Jacob, the man of all work, coming down. He had a trunk on his shoulder. Throughout the day she had been aware of a subdued excitement among the boarders. They had stopped about in groups, talking in low voices, talking about her, she believed, from the glances that were thrown over shoulders at her as she passed. She made herself as small as she could. But when tea-time came, and then supper, and Chinky had not appeared at either meal, curiosity got the better of her, and she tried to pump one of the younger girls. Maria came up while she was speaking, and the child ran away, for the little ones aped their elders in making Laura taboo. "'What, liar! You want to stuff us you don't know why she's gone?' said Maria. "'No, thank you. It's not good enough. You can't bamboozle us this time.' Sapphira up to her tricks again, is she? threw in the inseparable Kate, who had caught the last words. No, by dad, we don't tell liars what they know already, so put that in your pipe and smoke it. Only bit by bit did Laura dig out their meaning. Then the horrible truth lay bare. Chinky had been dismissed, privately, because she was a boarder, from the school. Her crime was, she had taken half a sovereign from the purse of one of her roommates. When taxed with the theft, she wept that she had not taken it for herself, but to buy a ring for Laura Rambotham. And with this admission on her lips, she passed out of their lives, leaving Laura, her confederate, behind. Yes, confederate, for in the minds of most, liar and thief were synonymous. Laura had not cared two straws for Chinky, she found what the latter had done mean and disgusting, and said so stormily, but of course was not believed. Usually too proud to defend herself, she here returned to the charge again and again, for the hint of connivance had touched her on the raw, but she strove in vain to prove her innocence. She could not get her enemies to grasp the abysmal difference between merely making up a story about people and laying hands on others' property. If she could do the one, she was capable of the other, and her companions remained convinced that, if she had not actually had her fingers in someone's purse, she had, by a love of jewelry, incited Chinky to the theft. And so, after a time, Laura gave up the attempt and suffered in silence. And it was suffering, for her schoolfellows were cruel with that intolerance, that unimaginative dullness, which makes a woman's cruelty so hard to bear. Laura had to accustom herself to hear every word she said doubted, to hear someone called to, before her face, to attest her statements, to see her roommates lock up their purses under her very nose. However, only three weeks had still to run till the Christmas holidays. She drew twenty-one strokes on a sheet of paper, which she pinned to the wall above her bed, and each morning she ran her pencil through a fresh line. She was quite resolved to beg Mother not to send her back to school, 
If she said she was not getting proper food, that would be enough to put Mother in arms. The boxes were being fetched from the lumber rooms and distributed among their owners, when a letter arrived from Mother saying that the two little boys had sandy blight and that Laura would not be able to come home under two or three weeks, for fear of infection. These weeks she was to spend, in company with Pin, at a watering place down the bay, where one of her aunts had a cottage. The news was welcome to Laura. She had shrunk from the thought of Mother's searching eye, and at the cottage there would be none of her grown-up relatives to face, only an old housekeeper who was looking after a party of boys. Hence, when speech day was over, instead of setting out on an up-country railway journey, Laura, under the escort of Miss Snodgrass, went on board one of the steamers that ploughed the bay. "'I should say, see, air'll do you good, brighten you up a bit,' said the governess affably as they drove. She was in great good humour at the prospect of losing sight for a time of the fifty-five. "'You seem to be always in the dumps nowadays.' Laura dutifully waved her handkerchief from the deck of the Silver Star, and the paddles began to churn. As Miss Snodgrass's back retreated down the pier, and the breach between ship and land widened, she settled herself on her seat with a feeling of immense relief. At last, at last she was off. The morning had been a sore trial to her. In all the noisy and effusive leave-taking, she was odd man out. No one had been sorry to part from her. No one had extracted a promise that she would write. Her sole valediction had been a minatory shaft from Maria, if she valued her skin, to learn to stop telling crams before she showed up there again. Now she was free of them. She would not be humiliated afresh, would not need to stand eye to eye with anyone who knew of her disgrace for weeks to come. Perhaps never again, if Mother agreed. Her heart grew momentarily lighter and the farther they left Melbourne behind them, the higher her spirits rose. But then, too, was it possible, on this radiant December day, long to remain in what Miss Snodgrass had called the dumps? The sea was a blue-green mirror on the surface of which they swam. The sky was a stretched sheet of blue, in which the sun hung a very ball of fire. But the steamer cooled the air as it moved, and none of the white-clad people who, under the stretched white awnings, thronged the deck, felt oppressed by the great heat. In the middle of the deck a brass band played popular tunes. At a pretty watering-place where they stopped, Laura rose and crossed to the opposite railing. A number of passengers went ashore, pushing and laughing, but almost as many more came on board, all dressed in white and with eager animated faces. Then the boat stood to sea again, and sailed past high, grass-grown cliffs, from which a few old cannons pointing their noses at you watched over the safety of the bay, in the event, say, of the Japanese or the Russians entering the heads past the pretty township and the beflagged bathing enclosures on the beach below. They neared the tall granite lighthouse at the point, with the flagstaff at its side, where incoming steamers were signalled and as soon as they had rounded this corner they were in view of the heads themselves. From the distant cliffs there ran out, on either side, brown reefs which made the inrushing water dance and foam, and the entrance to the bay narrow and dangerous. On one side there projected the portion of a wreck which had lain there as long as Laura had been in the world. Then, having made a sharp turn to the left, the boat crossed to the opposite coast, and steamed past barrack-like buildings laying asleep in the fierce sunshine of the afternoon, and in due course it stopped at Laura's destination. Old Anne was waiting on the jetty, having hitched the horse to a post. She had driven in in the Shandry Dan to meet Laura, for the cottage was not on the front beach, with the hotels and boarding-houses, the fenced-in baths, and great gentle slopes of yellow sand. It stood in the bush, on the back beach, which gave to the open sea. Laura took her seat beside the old woman in her linen sunbonnet, the body of the vehicle being packed full of groceries and other stores, and the drive began. Directly they were clear of the township, the road, as good as ceased, became a mere sandy track, running through a scrub of tea-trees. And what sand! White, dry, sliding sand, through which the horse shuffled and floundered, in which the wheels sank and stuck. 
had one of the many hillocks to be taken, the two on the box seat instinctively threw their weight forward. Old Anne, who had a stripped wattle bow for a whip, urged and conjoled, and more than once she handed Laura the reins and got out to give the horse a pull. They had always to be ducking their heads, too, to let the low tea-tree branches sweep over their backs. About a couple of miles out, the old woman alighted and slipped a rail, and having passed the only other house within Cooey, they drove through a paddock, but at a walking pace, because of the thousands of rabbit burrows that perforated the ground. Another slip rail lowered. They drew up at the foot of a steepish hill, beside a sandy little vegetable garden, a shed, and a pump. The house was perched on the top of the hill, and directly they sighted it, they also saw Pin flying down, her sunbonnet on her neck. "'Laura! Laura! Oh, I am glad you've come! What a time you've been!' "'Hello, Pin! Oh, I say, let me get out first. "'And pull up your bonnet, honey. Do you want to be after getting sunstruck?' Glad though Laura was to see her sister again, she did not manage to infuse a very hearty tone into her greeting, for her first glimpse of Pin had given her a disagreeable shock. It was astonishing, the change the past half-year had worked in the child, and as the two climbed the hill together, to the accompaniment of Pin's bubbly talk, Laura stole look after look at her little sister, in the hope of growing used to what she saw. Pin had never been pretty, but now she was downright hideous, as Laura phrased it to herself. Eleven years of age, she had at last begun to grow in earnest. Her legs were as of old mere spindle-shanks, but nearly twice as long, and her fat little body, perched above them, made one think of a shriveled-up old man who has run all to paunch. Her face, too, had increased in shapelessness, the features being blurred in the fat mass. Her blue eyes were more slit-like than before, and to cap everything, her fine skin had absolutely no chance, so bespattered was it with freckles. And none of your pretty little sun-kisses, but large, black, irregular freckles that disfigured like moles. Laura felt quite distressed. It outraged her feelings that anyone belonging to her should be so ugly, and as Pin, in happy ignorance of her sister's reflections, chattered on, Laura turned over in her mind what she ought to do. She would have to tell Pin about herself. That was plain. She must break the news to her, in case others should do it, and more cruelly. It was one consolation to know that Pin was not sensitive about her looks, so long as you did not tease her about her legs. There was no limit to what you might say to her. The grieving was all for the onlooker. But not today. This was the first day, and there were pleasanter things to think of. So, when they had had tea, with condensed milk in it, for the cow had gone dry, and no milkman came out so far, when tea was over, and that was all that could be undertaken in the way of refreshment after the journey, washing your face and hands, for instance, was out of the question. Every drop of water was to be carried up the hill from the pump, and old Anne purposely kept the ewers empty by day. If you would wash, you must wash in the sea. As soon, then, as tea was over, the two sisters made for the beach. The four-roomed, weatherboard cottage, to which at a later date a lean-to had been added, faced the bush. From the veranda there was a wide view of the surrounding country. Between the back of the house and the beach rose a huge sand-hill, sparsely grown with rushes and coarse grass. It took you some twenty minutes to toil over this, and boots and stockings were useless impedimenta, for the sand was once more of that loose and shifting kind, in which you sank at times up to the knees, falling back one step for every two you climbed. But then sand was the prevailing note of this free and easy life. It bestrewed veranda and floors. You carried it in your clothes. The beds were full of it. It even got into the food and you were soon so accustomed to its presence that you missed the grit of it underfoot, or the prickling on your skin, did old Anne happen to take a broom in her hand, or thoroughly remake the beds. When, however, on your way to the beach, you had laboriously attained the summit of the great dune, the sight that met you almost took your breath away. As far as the eye could reach, the bluest of skies, melting into the bluest of seas, which broke its foam-flecked edge against the flat brown reefs that fringed the shore. 
then downhill, with a trip and a flounder that sent the sand man-high, and at last you were on what Laura and Pin thought the most wonderful beach in the world. What a variety of things was there! Whitest, purest sand, hot to the touch as a zinc roof in summer, rocky caves and sandy caves, hung with crumbling stalactites. At low tide, on the reef, lakes and ponds and rivers deep enough to make it unnecessary for you to go near the ever-angry surf at all. Seaweeds that ran through the gamut of colors, brown and green, pearl pink and coral pink, to vivid scarlet and orange. Shells beginning with tiny grannies and cowries, and ending with the monsters in which the breakers had left their echo. The bones of cuttlefish, light as paper, and shaped like javelins. And what was best of all, this beach belonged to them alone. They had not to share its treasures with strangers, except the inhabitants of the cottage. Never a soul set foot upon it. The chief business of the morning was to bathe. If the girls were alone and the tide full, they threw off their clothes and ran into a sandy shallow pool where the water never came above their waists, and where it was safe to let the breakers dash over them. But if the tide were low, the boys bathed, too, and then Pin and Laura tied themselves up in old bathing gowns that were too big for them, and all went in a body to the half-moon hole. This pool, which was about twenty feet long and ten to fifteen deep, lay far out on the reef, and at high tide was hidden beneath surf and foam. At low water, on the other hand, it was like a glass mirror reflecting the sky, and so clear that you could see every weed that waved at the bottom. Having cast off your shoes, you applied your soles gingerly to the prickles of the rock. Then plop! In you went. Pin often needed a shove from behind, for nowhere, of course, could you get a footing. But Laura swam with the best. Some of the boys would dive to the bottom and bring up weeds and shells. But Laura and Pin kept on the surface of the water for they had the imaginative dread common to children who know the sea well, the dread of what may lurk beneath the thick black horrors of seaweed. Then, after an hour or so in the water, home to dinner, hungry as swagmen, though the bill of fare never varied, it was always rabbit for dinner, crayfish for tea, for the butcher called only once a week, and meat could not be kept an hour without getting fly-blown. The rabbits were skinned, and in the stew-pot before they were cold. The crayfish died an instant death, one that drove the blood to Laura's head, and made Pin run away and cry with her fingers in her ears, for she believed the sizzling of the water as the fish were dropped in to be the shriek of the creatures in their death agony. Except in bathing, the girls saw little of the boys. Both were afraid of guns, so did not go out on the expeditions which supplied the dinner-table, and old Anne, would not allow them to join the crayfishing excursions, for these took place by night, off the end of the reef, with nets and torches, and it sometimes happened, if the surf were heavy, that one of the fishers was washed off the rocks, and only hauled up again with considerable difficulty. Laura took her last peep at the outside world every evening, in the brief span of time between sunset and dark running up to the top of one of the hills, and letting her eyes range over sky and sea, she would drink in the scents that were waking to life after the burning heat of the day. Salt water, warmed sand and seaweeds, Thai scrub, sour grass, and the sturdy berry bushes high as her knee, through which she had plowed her way. That was one of the moments she liked best, that and lying in bed at night, listening to the roar of the surf, which went on and on like a cannonade, even though the hill lay between. It made her flesh crawl, too, in delightful fashion, did she picture to herself how alone she and Pin were in their room. The boys slept in the lean-to on the other side of the kitchen, old Anne at the back. For miles round, no house broke the solitude of the bush. Only a thin wooden partition separated her from possible bush-rangers, from the vastness and desolation of the night, the eternal booming of the sea. Such was the life into which Laura now threw herself heart and soul, forgetting, in the sheer joy of living, her recent tribulation. But even the purest pleasures will pall, and after a time, 
when the bloom had worn off, and the newness in her mind was more at leisure again, she made some disagreeable discoveries which ruffled her tranquillity. It was Pin, poor, fat, little well-meaning Pin, who did the mischief. Pin was not only changed in looks, her character had changed, too, and in so marked a way that before a week was out the sisters were at loggerheads. Each day made it plainer to Laura that Pin was developing a sturdy independence. She had ceased to look up to Laura as a prodigy of wisdom, and had begun to hold opinions of her own. She was, indeed, even disposed to be critical of her sister, and criticism from this quarter was more than Laura could brook. It was just as if a slave usurped his master's rights. At first speechless with surprise, she ended by losing her temper, the more because Pin was prone to be mullish, and could not be got to budge, either by derision or by scorn, from her espoused views. They were those of the school at which, for the past half-year, she had been a day-pupil, and seemed to be unassailable. Laura found them ridiculous, as she did much else about Pin at this time. Her ugliness, her setting herself up as an authority, and she jeered unkindly whenever Pin came out with them. A still more ludicrous thing was that, despite her plainness, Pin actually had an admirer. True, she did not say so outright. Perhaps she was not even aware of it. But Laura gathered from her talk with a boy at her school, a boy some three years older than herself, had given her a silk handkerchief, and liked to help her with her sums. And to Laura this was the most knock-down blow of all. One day it came to an open quarrel between them. They were lying on the beach after bathing, trying to protect their bare and blistered legs from the sand-flies. Laura, flat on her back, had spread a towel over hers. Pin sat Turk-fashion, with her legs beneath her, and fought the flies with her hands. Having vainly endeavored to draw from the reticent Laura some of those school tales of which, in former holidays, she had been so prodigal, Pin was now chattering to her heart's content about the small doings of home. Laura listened to her with the impatient toleration of one who has seen the world. She really could not be expected to interest herself in such trifles, and she laughed in her sleeve at Pin's simpleness. When, however, her little sister began to enlarge anew on some wonderful orders Mother had lately had, she could not refrain from saying crossly, "'You've told me that a dozen times already, and you needn't bawl it out for everyone to hear.' "'Oh, Laura, there isn't anyone anywhere near us. And even if there were, why, I thought you'd be so pleased. Mother's going to give you an extra shilling pocket money cause of it.' "'Of course I'm pleased. Don't be silly, Pin.' "'I'm not always silly, Laura,' protested Pin, "'and I don't believe you are glad a bit. "'Old Anne was, though. "'She said, "'Bless her dear heart.' "'Old Anne? "'Well, I just wonder what next. "'It's none of her dashed business.' "'Oh, Laura,' began Pin, "'growing tearful both at words and tone, "'why, Laura, you're not ashamed of it, are you, "'that Mother does sewing?' "'And Pin opened her lobelia blue eyes to their widest.' showing what very big eyes they would be, were they not so often swollen with crying. "'Of course not,' said Laura tartly. "'But I'm blessed if I can see what it's got to do with old Anne. "'But she asked me what Mother was working at, and if Mother's got any new customers. "'She just loves Mother.' "'Like her cheek,' snapped Laura, poking her ugly old nose into what doesn't concern her. "'You should just have said you didn't know.' "'But that would have been a story, Laura,' cried Pin, horrified. "'I did know quite well.' "'Good gracious, Pin, you—' "'I've never told a story in my life,' said Pin hotly. "'And I'm not going to, either, for you or anyone. "'I think you ought to be ashamed of yourself.' "'Hold your silly tongue. "'I shan't, Laura, and I think you're very wicked. "'You're not a bit like what you used to be. "'And it's all going to school that's done it. "'Mother says it is.' "'Oh, don't be such a blooming ass,' said Laura, stung to the quick, retaliated by taunting Pin with the change that had come to pass in her appearance. To her surprise, she found Pin grown inordinately touchy about her looks. At Laura's brutal statement of the truth, she cried bitterly, "'I'm not! No, I'm not! I haven't got a full moon for a face! It's no fatter than yours! Sarah said last time you were home how fat you were getting!' 
"'I'm sure I'm not,' said Laura, indignant in her turn. "'Yes, you are,' sobbed Pin. "'But you only think other people are ugly, not yourself. "'I'll tell Mother what you've said as soon as ever I get home. "'And I'll tell her, too, you want to make me tell stories, "'and that I'm sure you've done something naughty at school, "'cause you won't ever talk about it, "'and how you're always saying bad words like blooming and gosh and golly. "'Yes, I will!' "'You are always a sneak and a tell-tale. "'And you are always a greedy, selfish, deceitful thing. "'You don't know anything about me, you numbskull, you. "'I don't want to. I know you're a bad, wicked girl.' "'After this exchange of home truths, "'they did not speak to each other for two days. "'Pin had a temper that smoldered and could not easily forgive. "'So she stayed at old Anne's side, "'helping to bake scones and leather jackets.' or trotted after the boys, who had dropped into the way of saying, "'Come on, little pin,' as they never said, "'Come on, Laura,' and Laura retired in lonely dudgeon to the beach. She took the estrangement so much to heart that she eased her feelings by abusing Pin in thought. Pin was a pig-headed little ignoramus, as timid as ever of setting one foot before the other, and the rest of them would be just the same, old stick-in-the-muds, unchanged by a hair, or if they had changed, then changed for the worse. Laura had somehow never foreseen the day on which she would find herself out of tune with her home circle. With unthinking assurance she had expected that Pin, for instance, would always be eager to keep pace with her. Now she saw that her little sister would probably never catch up to her again. Such progress as Pin might make, if she were not already glued firm to her silly notions, would be in quite another direction. For the quarrel had made one thing plain to Laura, with regard to her troubles, she need not look to Pin for sympathy. If Pin talked such gibberish at the hint of putting off an inquisitive old woman, what would she, and not she alone, what would they all say to the tissue of lies Laura had spun round Mr. Shepherd, a holy man, a clergyman, and a personal friend of mother's into the bargain? She could not blink the fact that, did it come to their ears, they would call her in earnest, what Pin had called her in her temper, bad and wicked. Home was, alas, no longer the snug nest in which she was safe from the slings and shanghais of the world. And then there was another thing. Did she stay at home, she would have to relive herself into the thousand and one gimcrack concerns which now, as set forth by Pin, so bored her. The colic leppy had brought on by eating unripe fruit the fact that another of Sarah's teeth had dropped out without extraneous aid. It was all very well for a week or two, but at the idea of shutting herself wholly up with such mopokes, of cutting herself off from her present vital interests, Laura hastily reconsidered her decision to leave school. No, badly as she had suffered at her companion's hands, much as she dreaded returning, it was at school she belonged. All her heart was there, in the doings of her equals, the things that really mattered, who would be promoted, who perfect, whose seat changed in the dining hall. Besides, could one who had experienced the iron rule of Mr. Strachey or Mrs. Gurley ever be content to go back and just form one of a family of children? She not, at any rate. Thus she lay all day long, her hands clasped under her neck, a small white speck on the great wave-lapped beach. She watched the surf break, watched the waves creep up and hide the reef, watched the gulls vanish in the sun-saturated blue overhead. Sometimes she rose to her elbow to follow a ship just inside the horizon, and it pleased her to think that this great boat was sailing off, with a load of lucky mortals, to some unknown, fairer world, while she, a poor Cinderella, had to stop behind, even though she knew it was only the English mail going to Sydney. Of Pin she preferred not to think, nor could she dwell with equanimity on her late misfortunes at school and the trials that awaited her on her reappearance. And since she had to think of something, she fell into the habit of making up might have been, of narrating to herself how things would have fallen out had her fictions been fact, her ascetic hero, the impetuous lover she had made of him. In other words, lying prostrate on the sand, Laura went on with her story. When towards the end of the third week she and Pin were summoned to spend some days with Godmother, she had acquired such a gusto for this occupation 
that she preferred to shirk reality, and let Pin pay the visit alone. CHAPTER Twenty. Wie sollte ein Strom nicht endlich den Weg zum Meere finden? Nietzsche Sea, sun, and air did their healing work, as did also the long idle days in the home garden, and Laura drank in health and vigour with every breath. She had need of it all when, the golden holidays over, she returned to school, for the half-year that broke was, in many ways, the most trying she had yet had to face. True, her dupe's first virulence had waned. They no longer lashed her openly with their tongues. But the quiet, covert insults that were now the rule were every bit as hard to bear. And before a week had passed, Laura was telling herself that, had she been a Christian martyr, she would have preferred to be torn asunder with one jerk rather than submit to the thumbkin. Not an eye but looked askance at her, on every face was painted a reminder of her moral inferiority, and even newcomers among the boarders soon learnt, without always knowing what her crime had been, that Laura Rambotham was not the thing. This system of slight and disparagement was similar to what she had had to endure in her first school term but its effect upon her was different. Then, in her raw timidity, she had bowed her head beneath it. Now she could not be so lamb-like. In thought she never ceased to lay half the blame of what had happened on her companion's shoulders, and she was embittered by their injustice in making her alone responsible, when all she had done was to yield to their craving for romance. She became a rebel wrapping herself round in the cloak of bitterness which the outcasts of fortune wear, feeding on her hate of those within the pale. Very well, then, she said to herself, if her fellows chose to shut her out like this, she would stop outside, and never see eye to eye with them again. And it gave her an unholy pleasure to mock, in secret, at all they set store by. Her outward behaviour for many a day was, none the less, that of a footlicker, and by no sign did she indicate what she really was, a very unhappy girl. Like most rebels of her sex, she ardently desired to re-enter the fold of law and order, and it was to this end she worked, although, wherever she approached it, the place seemed to bristle with spears. But she did not let herself be daunted. She pocketed injuries, pretended not to hear them, played the spaniel to people she despised, and it soon became open talk, that no matter what you said to her, Laura Rambotham would not take offence. THE GETTING OF WISDOM by Henry Handel Richardson DEDICATION TO MY UNNAMED LITTLE COLLABORATOR Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting get understanding. PROVERBS 4, VERSE 7 Chapter Twenty Two Und vergesst mir auch das gute Lachen nicht, Nietzsche. And then, alas, just as she rode high on this wave of approbation, Laura suffered another of those drops in the esteem of her fellows, another of those mental upsets which from time to time had thrown her young life out of gear. True. What now came was not exactly her own fault, though it is doubtful whether a single one of her companions would have made her free of an excuse. They looked on round-eyed, mouths astretch. Once more the lambkin called Laura saw fit to sunder itself from the flock, and to cut mad capers in sight of them all, and their delectation was as frank as their former wrath had been. As for Laura, as usual she did not stop to think till it was too late but danced lightly away to her own undoing. The affair began pleasantly enough. A member of the literary society was the girl with the twinkly brown eyes, she who had gone out of her way to give Laura a kindly word after the shepherd debacle. This girl, Evelyn Souter by name, was also the only one of the audience 
who had not joined in the laugh provoked by Laura's first appearance as an author. Laura had never forgotten this, and she would smile shyly at Evelyn when their looks met. But a dozen reasons existed why there should have been no further rapport between them. Although, now in the fifth form, Laura had remained childish for her age, whereas Evelyn was over eighteen, and only needed to turn up her hair to be quite grown up. She had matriculated the previous Christmas, and was, at present, putting away a rather desultory half-year, before leaving school for good. In addition, she was rich, pampered, and very pretty, the last comrade in the world for drab little Laura. One evening, as the latter was passing through the dining-hall, she found Evelyn, who studied where she chose, disconsolately running her fingers through her gold-brown hair. "'I say, Kitty," she called to Laura, "'you know Latin, don't you? Just give us a hand with this.' Latin had not been one of Evelyn's subjects, and she was now employing some of her spare time in studying the language with Mr. Strachey, who taught it after a fashion of his own. "'How on earth would you say? We had not, however, rid here so long, but should have tidied it up the river. What's the old fool mean by that?" And she pushed an open volume of Robinson Crusoe towards Laura. Laura helped to the best of her ability. "'Thanks awfully,' said Evelyn. "'You're a clever chickabiddy. But you must let me help you with something in return. What's hardest?' "'Filling baths and papering rooms,' replied Laura candidly. "'Arithmetic, eh? Well, if ever you want a sum done, come to me.' But Laura was temperamentally unable to accept so vague an invitation, and here the matter closed. When, consequently, Miss Chapman summoned her one evening to tell her that she was to change her present bedroom for Evelyn's, the news came as a great shock to her. "'Change my room?' she echoed, in slow disgust. "'Oh, I can't, Miss Chapman!' "'You've got to, Laura, if Mrs. Gurley says so,' epostulated the kindly governess. "'But I won't. There must be some mistake. Just when I'm so comfortably settled, too. Very well, then, Miss Chapman, I'll speak to Mrs. Gurley myself.' She carried out this threat, and, for daring to question orders, received the soundest snubbing she had had for many a long day. That night she was very bitter about it all and the more so because Mary and Cupid did not, to her thinking, show sufficient sympathy. "'I believe you're both glad I'm going. It's a beastly shame. Why must I always be odd man out?' "'Look here, infant, don't adopt that tone, please,' said Cupid magisterially, "'or you'll make us glad in earnest. People who are always up in arms about things are the greatest bores in the world.' So, the following afternoon, Laura wryly took up armfuls of her belongings, mounted a story higher, and deposited them on the second bed in Evelyn's room. The elder girl had had this room to herself for over a year now, and Laura felt sure would be chafing inwardly at her intrusion. For days she stole mousily in and out, avoiding the hours when Evelyn was there, getting up earlier in the morning, hurrying into bed at night and feeling very sore indeed at the sufferance on which she supposed herself to be. But once Evelyn caught her, and said, "'Don't for gracious sake knock each time you want to come in, child. This is your room now as well as mine.' Laura reddened, and blurted out something about knowing how she must hate to have her stuck in there. Evelyn wrinkled up her forehead and laughed. "'What rot!' Do you think I'd have asked to have you if I hated it so much?" "'You asked to have me?' gasped Laura. "'Of course. Didn't you know? Old Gurley said I'd need to have someone, so I chose you.' Laura was too dumbfounded, and too diffident, to ask the grounds of such a choice. But the knowledge that it was so worked an instant change in her. In all the three years she had been at school, she had not got beyond a surface friendliness with any of her fellows. Even those who had been her chums had wandered like shades through the groves of her affection, rough, teasing Bertha, pretty, lazy Inez, perky Tilly, slangily frank Maria and Kate, Mary and her moral influence, clever, instructive Cupid, 
to none of them had she been drawn by any deeper sense of affinity. And though she had come to believe, in the course of the last, more peaceful year, that she had grown used to being what you would call an unpopular girl, one, that is, with whom no one ever shared a confidence, yet seldom was there a child who longed more ardently to be liked, or suffered more acutely under dislike. Apart, however, from the brisk manner she had contracted in her search after truth, it must be admitted that Laura had but a small talent for friendship. She did not grasp the constant give-and-take intimacy implies. The liking of others had to be brought to her, unsought. She, on the other hand, being free to stand back and consider whether or no the feeling was worth returning. And friends are not made in this fashion. But Evelyn had stoutly, and without waiting for permission, crossed the barrier, and each new incident in her approach was pleasanter than the last. Laura was pleased, and flattered, and round the place where her heart was she felt a warm and comfortable glow. She began to return the liking with interest, after the manner of a lonely bottled-up child, and everything about Evelyn made it easy to grow fond of her. To begin with, Laura loved pretty things and pretty people, and her new friend was out and away the prettiest girl in the school. Then, too, she was clever, and that counted, you did not make a friend of a fool. But her chief characteristics were a certain sound common sense, and an inexhaustible fund of good nature, a careless, happy, laughing sunniness that was as grateful to those who came into touch with it as a rare ointment is grateful to the skin. This kindliness arose, it might be, in the first place from indolence. It was less trouble to be merry and amiable than to put oneself out to be selfish, which also meant standing a fire of disagreeable words and looks. And then, too, it was really hard for one who had never had a whim crossed to be out of humour. But, whatever its origin, the good nature was there, everlastingly, and Laura soon learnt that she could cuddle in under it and be screened by it, as a lamb is screened by its mother's woolly coat. Evelyn was the only person who did not either hector her, or feel it a duty to clip and prune at her. She accepted Laura for what she was, for herself. Indeed, she even seemed to lay weight on Laura's bits of opinions, which the girl had grown so chary of offering. And under the sunshine of this treatment, Laura shot up and flowered like a spring bulb, she began to speak out her thoughts again. She unbosomed herself of dark little secrets, and finally did what she would never have believed possible. Sitting one night in her nightgown, on the edge of Evelyn's bed, she made a full confession of the pickle she had got herself into over her visit to the shepherds. To her astonishment, Evelyn, who was already in bed, laughed till the tears ran down her cheeks. At Laura's solemn-faced incredulity, she said, I say, Kitty, but that was rich. To think a chicken of your size sold them like that. It's the best joke I've heard for an age. Tell us again, from the beginning." Nothing loath, Laura started in afresh, and in this, the second telling, embroidered the edge of her tail with a few fancy stitches, in a way she had not ventured on for months past, so that Evelyn was more tickled than before. No wonder they were mad about being had like that. You little rascal!" She was equally amused by Laura's description of the miserable week she had spent, trying to make up her mind to confess. "'You ridiculous sprat! Why didn't you come to me? We'd have let them down with a good old bump!' But Laura could not so easily forget the humiliations she had been forced to suffer, and delicately hinted to her friend at M.P.'s moral strictures. With her refreshing laugh, Evelyn brushed these aside as well. Tommy Rot. Never mind that old jumble sale of all the virtues. It was jolly clever of a mite like you to bamboozle them as you did. Take my word for that." This Jocko's way of treating the matter seemed to put it in an entirely new light. Laura could even smile at it herself. In the days that followed, she learned, indeed, to laugh over it with Evelyn, and to share the latter's view that she had been superior in wit to those she had befooled. This meant a great and healthy gain in self-assurance for Laura. It also led to her laying more and more weight on what her friend said. 
for it was not as if Evelyn had a low moral standard. Far from that, she was honest and straightforward, too proud, or it might be, too lazy to tell a lie herself, with all the complications lying involved, and Laura never heard her say a harder thing of any one than what she had just said about Mary Pidwell. The two talked late into every night after this. Laura perched monkey-fashion on the side of her friend's bed. Evelyn had all the accumulated wisdom of eighteen, and was able to clear her young companion up on many points about which Laura had so far been in the dark. But when, in time, she came to relate the mortifications she had suffered, and was still called on to suffer, at the hands of the other sex, Evelyn pooh-poohed the subject. "'Time enough in a couple of years for that. Don't bother your head about it in the meantime.' "'I don't now. Not a bit. I only wanted to know why. Sometimes, Evie, do you know, they liked to talk to quite little kids of seven and eight better than me. Perhaps you talk too much yourself, and about yourself. I don't think I did. And if you don't talk something, they yawn and go away. You've got to let them do the lion's share, child. Just you sit still and listen, and pretend you like it, even though you're bored to extinction. And they never need to pretend anything, I suppose. No, I think they're horrid. You don't like them either, Evie, do you? Any more than I do? Evelyn laughed. Say what you think they are, persisted Laura, and waggled the other's arm to make her speak. Mostly fools, said Evelyn, and laughed again, laughed in all the conscious power of lovely eighteen. Overjoyed at this oneness of mind, Laura threw her arms round her friend's neck and kissed her. "'You dear,' she said. And yet, a short time afterwards, it was on this very head that she had to bear the shock of a rude awakening. Evelyn's people came to Melbourne that year, from the Riverina. Evelyn was allowed considerable freedom, and one night, by special permit, Laura also accepted an invitation to dinner and the theatre. The two girls drove to a hotel, where they found Evelyn's mother, elegant, but a little stern, and a young lady friend. Only the four of them were present at dinner, and the meal passed off smoothly, though the strangeness of dining in a big hotel had the effect of tying Laura's tongue. Another thing that abashed her was the dress of the young lady who sat opposite. This person, she must have been about the ripe age of twenty-five was nipped into a tight little pink satin bodice, which, at the back, exposed the whole of two very bony shoulder-blades. But it was the front of the dress that Laura faced, and having imbibed strict views of propriety from mother, she wriggled on her chair whenever she raised her eyes. They drove to the theatre, though it was only a few doors off. The seats were in the dress circle. The ladies sat in the front row, the girls, who were in high frocks, behind. Evelyn made a face of laughing discontent. "'It's so ridiculous the mater won't let me dress!' These words gave Laura a kind of stab. "'Oh, Evie, I think you're ever so much nicer as you are,' she whispered, and squeezed her friend's hand. Evelyn could not answer, for the lady in pink had leant back and tapped her with her fan. "'It doesn't look as if Jim were coming, my dear.' Evelyn laughed in a peculiar way. Oh, I guess he'll turn up all right. There had been some question of a person of this name at dinner, but Laura had paid no great heed to what was said. Now she sat up sharply, for Evelyn exclaimed, There he is! It was a man, a real man, not a boy, with a drooping fair moustache, a single eyeglass in one eye, and a camellia bud in his buttonhole. For the space of a breathless second, Laura connected him with the pink satin. Then he dropped into a vacant seat at Evelyn's side. From this moment on, Laura's pleasure in her expensive seat, in the pretty blue theatre and its movable roof, in the gay trickeries of the Mikado, slowly fizzled out. Evelyn had no more thought for her. Now and then, it is true, she would turn in her affectionate way and ask Laura if she were all right just as one satisfies oneself that a little child is happy. 
but her real attention was for the man at her side. In the intervals the two kept up a perpetual buzz of chat, broken only by Evelyn's low laughs. Laura sat neglected, sat stiff and cold with disappointment, a great bitterness welling up within her. Before the performance had dragged to an end, she would have liked to put her head down and cry. Tired? queried Evelyn, noticing her pinched look, as they drove home in the wagonette. But the mother was there too, so Laura said no. Directly, however, the bedroom door shut behind them, she fell into a tantrum, a fit of sullen rage, which she accentuated till Evelyn could not but notice it. What's the matter with you? Didn't you enjoy yourself? No, I hated it, returned Laura passionately. Evelyn laughed a little at this, but with an air of humorous dismay. I must take care, then, not to ask you out again. I wouldn't go, not for anything. What on earth's the matter with you? Nothing's the matter. Well, if that's all, make haste and get into bed. You're overtired. Go to bed yourself. I am, as fast as I can. I can hardly keep my eyes open. And Evelyn yawned heartily. When Laura saw that she meant it, she burst out. You're nothing but a storyteller, that's what you are. You said you didn't like them, that they were mostly fools, and then, then to go on as you did tonight. Her voice was shaky with tears. Oh, that's it, is it? Come now, get to bed. We'll talk about it in the morning. I never want to speak to you again. You're a silly child, but I'm really too sleepy to quarrel with you tonight. I hate you, hate you. I shall survive it. She turned the light out as she spoke, settled herself on her pillow, and composedly went to sleep. Laura's rage redoubled. Throwing herself on the floor, she burst into angry tears, and cried as loudly as she dared, in the hope of keeping her companion awake. But Evelyn was a magnificent sleeper, and remained undisturbed. So, after a time, Laura rose, drew up the blind, opened the window, and sat down on the sill. It was a bitterly cold night, of milky white moonlight, each bush and shrub carved its jet-black shadow on paths and grass. Across Evelyn's bed fell a great patch of light. This or the chill air would, it was to be trusted, wake her. Meanwhile Laura sat in her thin nightgown and shivered, feeling the cold intensely after the great heat of the day. She hoped with all her heart that she would be lucky enough to get an inflammation of the lungs. Then Evelyn would be sorry she had been so cruel to her. It was nearly two o'clock, and she had several times found herself nodding, when the sleeper suddenly opened her eyes and sat bolt upright in bed. "'Laura! Good heavens! What are you doing at the window? Oh, you wicked child! You'll catch your death of cold! Get into bed at once!' And. The culprit still maintaining an immovable silence, Evelyn dragged her to bed by main force, and tucked her in as tightly as a mummy. Chapter 23 Gut and Boas and Lust and Lied and Ich and Du Nietzsche Laura, you're a cipher. I'm nothing of the sort threw back Laura indignantly. You're one yourself. What does she mean, Evie? she asked, getting out of earshot of the speaker. Goodness knows. Don't mind her, Poppet. It was an oppressive evening. All day long a hot north wind had scoured the streets, veiling things and people in clouds of gritty dust. The sky was still like the prolonged reflection of a great fire. The hoped-for change had not come and the girls who strolled the paths of the garden were white and listless. They walked in couples, with interlaced arms, and members of the matriculation class carried books with them, the present year being one of much struggling and heart-burning, and few leisured moments. Mary Pidwell and Cupid were together under an acacia tree at the gate of the tennis court, and it was M.P. who had cast the above jibe at Laura. At least, Laura took it as a jibe, and scowled darkly, for she could never grow hardened to ridicule. 
As she and Evelyn repassed this spot in their perambulation, a merry little lump of a girl called Lolo, who darted her head from side to side when she spoke, with the movements of a watchful bird, this Lolo called, "'Evelyn, come here! I want to tell you something!' "'Yes, what is it?' asked Evelyn, but without obeying the summons, for she felt Laura's grip of her arm tighten. "'It's a secret. You must come over here!' "'Hold on a minute, Poppet,' said Evelyn persuasively, and crossed the lawn with her characteristically lazy saunter. Minutes went by. She did not return. "'Look at her Laura ship,' said a sauce-box to her partner. The latter made, "'Hee-haw! Hee-haw!' and both laughed derisively. The object of their scorn stood at the farther end of the wire-net fence. All five fingers of her right hand were thrust through the holes of the netting, and held oddly and unconsciously outspread. She stood on one leg, and with her other foot rubbed up and down behind her ankle. Mouth and brow were sullen, her black eyes bent wrathfully on her faithless friend. "'A regular moon-calf,' said Cupid, looking up from the tempest, which was balanced breast-high on the narrow wooden top of the fence. "'Mark my words, that child will be plucked in her tests,' observed M.P. "'Serve her right, say I, for playing the billy-ass,' returned Cupid, and killed a giant mosquito with such a whack that her wrist was stained with its blood. "'Ugh! You brute! Gorging yourself on me! But I'm dashed if I know how Evelyn can be bothered to have her always dangling round.' "'She's a cipher,' repeated Mary, in so judicial a tone that it closed the conversation. Laura, not altogether blind to externals, saw that her companions made fun of her. But at the present pass the strength of her feelings quite outran her capacity for self-control. She was unable to disguise what she felt, and though it made her the laughing stock of the school. What scheme was the bird-like Lolo hatching against her? Why did Evelyn not come back? These were the thoughts that buzzed round inside her head as the mosquitoes buzzed outside. And meanwhile the familiar, foolish noises of the garden at evening knocked at her ear. On the other side of the hedge a batch of third-form girls were whispering, with choked laughter, a doggerel rhyme which was hard to say, and which meant something quite different did the tongue trip over a certain letter. Of two girls who were playing tennis in half-hearted fashion, the one next to Laura said, Oh, damn! every time she missed a ball. And over the parched, dusty grass the hot wind blew, carrying with it from the kitchens a smell of cabbage, of fried onions, of greasy dishwater. Then Evelyn returned, and a part, a part only, of the cloud lifted from Laura's brow. What did she want? Oh, nothing very much. Then you're not going to tell me? I can't. "'What business has she to have secrets with you?' said Laura furiously, and for a full round of the garden she did not open her lips. Her companions were not alone in eyeing this lopsided friendship with an amused curiosity. The governesses also smiled at it, and were surprised at Evelyn's endurance of the tyranny into which Laura's liking had degenerated. On this particular evening, two who were sitting on the veranda bench came back to the subject. "'Just look at that Laura Rambotham again, will you?' said Miss Snodgrass, in her tart way. "'Sulking for all she's worth. What a little fool she is! "'I'm sure I wonder Mrs. Gurley hasn't noticed how badly she's working just now,' said Miss Chapman, and her face wore it best meaning, but most uncertain smile. "'Oh, you know very well if Mrs. Gurley doesn't want to see a thing, she doesn't retorted Miss Snodgrass. A regular talent for going blind, I call it, especially where Evelyn Soot is concerned. Oh, I don't think you should talk like that, urged Miss Chapman nervously. I say what I think, asserted Miss Snodgrass, and if I had my way I'd give Laura Rambotham something she wouldn't forget. That child will come to a bad end yet. How do you like that colour, Miss C? She had a nest of cloth patterns in her lap, and held one up as she spoke. 
"'Oh, you shouldn't say such things,' remonstrated Miss Chapman. "'There's many a true word said in jest.' She settled her glasses on her nose. "'It's very nice, but I think I like a bottle green better. "'Of course, I don't mean she'll end on the gallows, if that's what troubles you. "'But she's frightfully unbalanced, and to my mind ought to have some sense knocked into her before it's too late. "'That's a better shade, isn't it?' "'Poor little Laura,' said Miss Chapman, and drew a sigh. "'Yes, I like that. Where did you say you were going to have the dress made?' Miss Snodgrass named, not without pride, one of the first warehouses in the city. "'I've been saving up my screw for it, and I mean to have something decent this time. Besides, I know one of the men in the shop, and I'm going to make them do it cheap.' And here they fell to discussing price and cut. Thus the onlookers laughed, and quizzed, and wondered. No one was bold enough to put an open question to Evelyn, and Evelyn did not offer to take anyone into her confidence. She held even hints and illusions at bay with her honeyed laugh, which was her shield against the world. Laura was the only person who ever got behind this laugh, and what she discovered there she did not tell. As it was, Varying motives were suggested for Evelyn's long-suffering, nobody being ready to believe that it could really be fondness, on her part, for the Byronic atom of humanity she had attracted to her. However that might be, the two girls, the big fair one and the little dark one, were, outside glass hours, seldom apart. Evelyn did not often, as in the case of the bird-like Lolo, give her young tyrant cause for offence. If she sometimes sought another's company, it was done in a roguish spirit, from a feminine desire to tease. Perhaps, too, she was at heart not averse to Laura's tantrums, or to testing her own power in quelling them. On the whole, though, she was very careful of her little friend's sensitive spots. She did not repeat the experiment of taking Laura out with her. As her stay at school drew to a close, she went out less frequently herself for the reason that, no matter how late it was on her getting back, she would find Laura obstinately sitting up in bed, wide awake, and it went against the grain in her to keep the pale-faced girl from sleep. On such occasions, while she undid her pretty muslin dress, unpinned the flowers she was never without, and loosened her gold-brown hair, which she had put up for the evening, while she undressed, Evelyn had to submit to a rigorous cross-examination. Laura demanded to know where she had been, what she had done, whom she had spoken to, and woe to her if she tried to shirk a question. Laura was not only jealous, she was extraordinarily suspicious, and the elder girl had need of all her laughing kindness to steer her way through the shallows of distrust. For a great doubt of Evelyn's sincerity had implanted itself in Laura's mind. She could not forget the incident of the mostly fools and, after an evening of this kind, she never felt quite sure that Evelyn was not deceiving her afresh, out of sheer goodness of heart, of course, by assuring her that she had had a horrid time, been bored to death, and would have much preferred to stay with her, when the truth was that, in the company of some moustached idiot or other, she had enjoyed herself to the top of her bent. On the night Laura learned that her friend had again met the loathly Jim, there was a great to do. In vain Evelyn laughed, reasoned, expostulated. Laura was inconsolable. "'Look here, Poppet,' said Evelyn at last, and was so much in earnest that she laid her hairbrush down, and took Laura by both her bony little shoulders. "'Look here. You surely don't expect me to be an old maid, do you? Me?' The pronoun signified all she might not say. It meant wealth youth, beauty, and an unbounded capacity for pleasure. Evie, you're not going to marry that horrid man. Of course not, Goosey. But that doesn't mean that I'm never going to marry at all, does it? Laura supposed not, with a tremendous sniff. Well, then, what is all the fuss about? It was not so easy to say. She was, of course, reconciled, she sobbed, to Evelyn marrying some day. Only plain and stupid girls were left to be old maids. 
but it must not happen for years and years and years to come, and when it did, it must be to someone much older than herself, someone she did not greatly care for. In short, Evelyn was to marry only to escape the odium of the single life. Having drawn this sketch of her future, word by word, from the weeping Laura, Evelyn fell into a fit of laughter which she could not stifle. "'Well, Poppet,' she said when she could speak, "'if that's your idea of happiness for me, we'll postpone it just as long as ever we can. I'm all there. For I mean to have a good time first, a jolly good time, before I tie myself up for ever, world without end. Amen.' "'That's just what I hate so, your good time, as you call it,' retorted Laura, smarting under the laughter. "'Everyone does, child. You'll be after it yourself when you're a little older.' "'Me? Never!' "'Oh, yes, indeed you will.' "'I won't. I hate men, and I always shall. And, oh, I thought,' with an upward, sobbing breath, "'I thought you liked me best.' Of course I like you, you silly child, but that's altogether different, and I don't like you any less because I enjoy having some fun with them, too. I don't want your old leavings, said Laura savagely. It hurt, almost as much as having a tooth pulled out, did this knowledge that your friend's affection was wholly yours, only as long as no man was in question. And out of the sting Laura added, Wait till I'm grown up and I'll show them what I think of them, the pigs." This time Evelyn had to hold her hand in front of her mouth. "'No, no, I don't mean to laugh at you. Come, be good now,' she petted. "'And you really must go to bed, Laura. It's past twelve o'clock, and that infernal machine will be going off before you've had any sleep at all.' The machine was Laura's alarm, which ran down every night just now at two o'clock. For, if one thing were sure, it was that affairs with Laura were in a sorry muddle. In this, the last and most momentous year of her school life, at the close of which, like a steep wall to be scaled, rose the university examination, she was behind with her work, and occupied a mediocre place in her class. So steadfastly was her attention pitched on Evelyn, that she could link it to nothing else. In the middle of an important task, her thoughts would stray to contemplate her friend, or wonder what she was doing, while, if Evelyn were out for the evening, Laura gave up her meagre pretense of study altogether, and moodily propped her head in her hand. This was why she had hit on the small hours for the necessary cramming. Then there were no distractions. The great house was as still as an empty church, and Evelyn lay safe and sound before her. So punctually, at two o'clock, Laura was startled with a pounding heart out of her first sleep, and lighting the gas, she sat up in bed and pored over her books. Evelyn was not disturbed by the light, or at least she did not complain, and it was certainly a famous time for committing things to memory. The subsequent hours of sleep seemed rather to etch the facts into your brain, rather than to blur them. You cannot, however, rob Peter to pay Paul, with impunity. And in the weeks that followed, despite her nightly industry, Laura made no headway. As the term tapered to an end, things went from bad to worse with her. And since, besides, the parting with Evelyn was at the door, she was often to be seen with red-rimmed eyelids, which she did not even try to conceal. As if she'd lost her nearest relation laughed her schoolfellows. And did they meet her privately, on the stairs or in a house corridor, they crossed their hands on their breasts and turned up their eyes in tragedy fashion. Laura hardly saw them. For once in her life ridicule could not have her. The nearer the time drew, the more completely did the coming loss of Evelyn push other considerations into the background. It was bitter to reflect that her present dear friendship had no more strength to endure than the thin pretenses of friendship she had hitherto played at. Evelyn and she would, no doubt, from time to time meet and take pleasure in each other again, but their homes lay hundreds of miles apart, and the intimacy of the school days was passing away, never to return. 
and no one could be held to blame for this. Evelyn's mother and father thought, rightly enough, that it was time for their daughter to leave school, but that was all. They did not really miss her, or need her. No, it was just a stupid, crushing piece of ill luck, which happened one did not know why. The ready rebel in Laura sprang into being again, and she fought hard against the lesson that there are events in life, bitter, grim and grotesque events, beneath which one can only bow one's head. A further effect of the approaching separation was to bring home to her a sense of the fleetingness of things. She began to grasp that, everywhere and always, even while you reveled in them, things were perpetually rushing to a close, and the fact of them being things you loved or enjoyed was powerless to diminish the speed at which they escaped you. Of course, though, these were sensations rather than thoughts, and they did not hinder Laura from going on her knees to Evelyn to implore her to remain. Day after day Evelyn kindly and patiently explained why this could not be, and if she sometimes drew a sigh at the child's persistence, it was too faint to be audible. Now Laura knew that it was possible to kill animal pets by surfeiting them, and towards the end a suspicion dawned on her that you might perhaps damage feelings in the same way. It stood to reason, no matter how fond two people were of each other, the one who was about to emerge, like a butterfly from its sheath, could not be asked to regret her release. And at moments, when Laura lay sobbing face downwards on her bed, or otherwise vented her pertinacious and disruly grief, at these moments she thought she scented a dash of relief in Evelyn at the prospect of deliverance. But such delicate hints on the part of the hidden self are rarely able to gain a hearing, and, as the days dropped off one by one, like overripe fruit, Laura surrendered herself more and more blindly to her emotions. The consequence was, M.P.'s prediction came true. In the test examinations which took place at midwinter, Laura, together with the few dunces of her class, was ignominiously plucked. And still staggering under this blow, she had to kiss Evelyn goodbye, and to set her face for home. Chapter 24 Was mich nicht umbringt, macht mich starker. Nietzsche Mother did not know or understand anything about tests, and Laura had no idea of enlightening her. She held her peace, and throughout the holidays hugged her disgraceful secret to her untold. She had never before failed to pass an examination, having always lightly skimmed the surface of them on wings of her parrot-like memory. Hence at home no one suspected that anything was amiss with her. The knowledge weighed the more heavily on her own mind, as if the other troubles were not enough, she was now beset by nervous fears about the future. She saw chiefly rocks ahead. If she did not succeed in getting through the final examination in summer, she would not be allowed to present herself for matriculation, and, did this happen, there would be the very devil to pay. All her schooling would, in Mother's eyes, have been for naught, for Mother was one of those people who laid tremendous weight on prizes and examinations as if offering tangible proof that your time had not been wasted or misspent. Besides this, she could not afford, in the event of failure, to pay the school fees for another year. The money which, by hook and by crook, had been scraped together and hoarded up for Laura's education, was now coming to an end. As it was, the next six months would have been a terrible pinching and screwing. The other children, too, were growing day by day more costly, their little minds and bodies clamoured for a larger share of attention and Laura's eyes were rudely opened to the struggle Mother had to make to both ends meet. While her firstborn was acquiring wisdom, for Mother spoke of it herself, spoke only of her means and resources, perhaps with some idea of rousing in Laura a gratitude that had so far been dormant. If this was her intention, she failed. Laura was much too fast entangled in her own troubles to have a leisure for such costly feelings as gratitude and Mother's outspokenness only added a fresh weight to her pack. It seemed as if everybody and everything were ranged against her, and guilty, careworn, lonely, she sh shrank into her shell. About school affairs she again kept her lips shut, 
enduring like a stubborn martyr the efforts close and deceitful this reticence earned her. Her time was spent in writing endless, scrawly letters to Evelyn, which covered days in sitting moodily at the top of the fir-tree which she climbed in defiance of her length of petticoat glaring at sunsets, and brooding on dead delights in taking long, solitary evening walks by choice on the heel of a thunderstorm, when the red earth was riddled by creeklets of running water till mother, haunted by a lively fear of encounters with swags or Chinamen, put her foot down and forbade them. Sufferers are seldom sweet-tempered, and Laura formed no exception. Pin, her most frequent companion, had to bear the brunt of her acrimony. Hence the two were soon at war again, for Pin was tactless, and took small heed of her sister's grumpy moods, save to cavil at them. Laura's button-upness, for instance, and her love of solitude were perverse leanings to Pin's mind, and she spoke out against them with the assurance of one who has public opinion at his back. Laura retaliated by falling foul of the little personal traits in Pin, a nervous habit she had of clearing her throat, her very walk. They quarrelled passionately, having branched as far apart as the end points of what is ultimately to be a triangle, between which the connecting lines have not yet been drawn. Sometimes they even came to blows. "'I'll fetch your ma to you, that I will,' threatened Sarah, called by the noise of the scuffle. "'Great girls like you, fighting like bandicoots. You ought to be downright ashamed of yourselves.' "'I don't know what's come over you two, I'm sure,' scolded Mother, when the combatants had been parted and brought before her in the kitchen where she was rolling pastry. "'You never used to go on like this. Pin, stop that noise. Do you want to deafen me?' "'She hit me first, sobbed Pin. "'It's always Laura who begins.' "'I'll teach her to cheek me like that.' "'Well, all I can say is,' said Mother, exasperated, "'and pushed the lock of hair off her perspiring forehead with the back of her hand. "'All I can say is, big girls as you are, "'you deserve to have the nonsense whipped out of you. "'And as for you, Laura, if this is your only return "'for all the money I've spent on you, "'then I wish from my heart you'd never seen the inside of that Melbourne school.' "'How pretty your eyes look, mother, when your eyelashes get flowery,' said Laura, struck by the vivid contrast of black and white. She merely stated the fact, without intent to flatter, her anger having been given to puffing out as suddenly as it kindled. "'Oh, get along with you,' said mother, at the same time skilfully lifting and turning a large, thin sh sheet of paste. "'You can't get round me like that.' "'You used to have nice ladylike manners,' she said on another occasion, when Laura, summoned to the drawing-room to see a visitor, had in mother's eyes disgraced them both. "'Now you've no more idea how to behave than a country bumpkin. You sit there like a stock on a stone, as if you didn't know how to open your mouth.' Mother was very cross. "'I didn't want to see that old frump anyhow,' retorted Laura, who inclined to charge the inhabitants of the township with an extreme provinciality. "'And what else was there to say but yes or no? "'She asked me all things I didn't know about. "'Did you—you you didn't want me to tell stories, I suppose? "'Well, if a child of mine doesn't know the difference "'between being polite and telling stories,' said Mother, completely outraged, "'then all I can say is it's a—a a great shame,' she wound up lamely, "'after the fashion of hot-tempered people who begin a sentence "'without being clear how they're going to end it. "'You were a nice enough child once. "'If only I'd never left you leave home.' The Jeremiah was repeated by mother and chorused by the rest till Laura grew incensed. She was roused to defend her present self at the cost of her perf past perfections, and this gave rise to new dissensions. So that in spite of what she had to face at school, she was not altogether sorry when the time came to turn her back on the unknowing and hence unsympathetic relations. She journeyed to Melbourne on one of those pleasant winter days when the sun shines from morning till night in a cloudless sky and the chief mark of the season is the extraordinary greenness of the grass, returned a pale, determined, lanky girl, full of the grimmest res resolutions. The first few days were like a bad dream. The absence of Evelyn came home to her in all its crushing force. A gap yawned drearily where Evelyn had been, but then she had been everywhere. There was now a kind of emptiness about the great school, except for memories which cropped up at each turn. Laura was in a strange room, with strange, indifferent girls, and for a time she felt as lonely as she had done in those unthinkable days when she was still the poor, little, green, new chum. Her companions were not willfully unkind to her. Her last extravagance had been foolish, not criminal, and two or three were even sorry for the woe-begone figure she cut. 
But her idolatrous attachment to Evelyn had been the means of again drawing round her one of those magic circles which held her schoolfellows at a distance and the aroma of her eccentricities still clung to her. The members of her class were deep in study, too. Little was now thought of or spoken of but the approaching examinations. And her first grief over, Laura set her teeth and flung herself on her lessons like a dog on a bone, endeavouring to pack the conscientious work of twelve months into less than six. The days were feverish with energy, but at night the loneliness returned, and it was only more intense because for some hours on end she had been able to forget it. On one such night, when she lay wakeful, haunted by the prospect of failure, she turned over the leaves of her Bible. She had been mes memorising her weekly portion, and read, not on a school task, but for herself. By chance she lighted on the fourteenth chapter of St. John, and the familiar, honey-sweet words fell on her like caresses. Her tears flowed, both at the beauty of the language and out of pity for herself. But before she closed the book, she knew she had found a well of comfort that would never run dry. In spite of certain flabbiness of out in its outward expression, deep down in Laura the supreme faith of childhood still dwelt intact. She believed with her whole heart in the existence of an all-knowing God, and just as implicitly in his perfect power to succour his human children at will. But thus far on her way she had not greatly needed him. At the most she had recourse to him for forgiveness of sin. Now, however, the sudden withdrawal of a warm human sympathy seemed to open up a new use for him. An aching void was in her and about her. It was for him to fill this void with the riches of his love. And she comforted herself for her previous lack of warmth by the reminder that his need also was chiefly over the laden and oppressed. In the spurt of intense religious fervour that now set in for her, it was to Christ she turned, by preference, rather than to the remoter God the Father. For of the latter she carried a kind of Michelangelesque picture in her brain, that of an old man with a flowing grey beard who sat, Turk fashion, one hand plucking at his beard, the other lying negligently across his knees. Christ, on the contrary, was a young man, kindly of face and full of tender invitation. To this younger, tenderer God she proffered long and glowing prayers which vied with one another in devoutness. Soon she felt herself led by him, felt herself a favourite lying on his breast, and as the days went by her ardour so increased that she could no longer consume the smoke of her own fire. It overspread her daily life to the renewed embarrassment of her schoolfellows. Was it then impossible, they asked themselves, for Laura Rambotham to do anything in a decorous and ladylike way? Must she at every step put them out of countenance? It was not respectable to be so fervent. Religion f felt they should be practised with modesty, be worn like an indispensable but private garment. Whereas she committed the gross error in taste of, as it were, parading it outside her other clothes. Laura, her thoughts turned heavenwards, did not look low enough to detect the distaste in her comrade's eyes. The farther she spun herself into intimacy with the deity, the more indifferent did she grow to the people and things of this world. Weeks passed, her feelings in the beginning of mere blissful certainty that God was love, and she was God's, ceased to be wholly passive. Thus her first satisfaction at her supposed election was soon ousted by self-righteousness. Did she contemplate her unremitting devotion? And one night, in her own eloquence at prayer, had brought the moisture to her eyes. One night the inspiration fell. Throughout these weeks she had faithfully worshipped God without asking so much as a pin's head from Him in return. She had given freely all she had, had been His. Now the time had surely come when she might claim to be rewarded. Now it was for Him to show that He had appreciated her homage. Oh, it was so easy a thing for him to help her, if he would, if only he would. Pressing her fingers to her eyeballs till the starry blindness was affected that induces ecstasy, she prostrated herself before the mercy seat, not omitting at this crisis to conciliate the Almighty by laying stress on her own exceeding unworthiness. O oh, dear Lord Jesus, have mercy upon me, miserable sinner! O oh, Christ, I ask thy humble pardon, for I have been weak. Lord, and have forgotten to serve thy holy name. My thoughts have erred and strayed like, like lost sheep, but loved thee, Jesus, all the time. My heart seemed full as it would hold. No, I didn't mean to say that, but I was not ever thus, nor prayed thou shouldst lead me on. 
But now, dear Jesus, if thou wilt only grant me my desire, I will never forget thee or be false to thee again. I will love thee and serve thee all the days of my life, till death do us, uh, I mean, only let me pass my examinations, Lord, and there is nothing I will not do for thee in return. O oh, dear Lord Jesus, Son of Mary, hear my prayers, and I will worship thee and adore thee, and never forget thee, and that thou hast died to save me. Grant me this, my prayer, Lord, for Christ's sake. Amen. It came to this. Laura made a kind of pact with God, in which his aid at the present juncture guaranteed her continuing and unswerving allegiance. The idea once lodged in her mind, she wrestled with him night after night, filling his ears with her petitions, and remaining on her knees for such an immoderate length of time that her roommates, who were sleepy, openly expressed their impatience. "'I'll draw it, mild Laura,' said the girl in the neighbouring bed, when it began to seem as if the supplicant would never rise to her feet again. "'Leave something to ask him to-morrow.' But Laura, knowing very well that the Lord our God is a jealous God, was mindful not to scrimp in lip service or to shirk the minutest ceremony by means of which he might be propitiated and won over. Her prayers of greeting and farewell on entering and leaving church were drawn out beyond any one else's. She did not doze or dream over a single clause of the litany, with its hypnotising refrain, and she did not only make the sign of the cross at the appropriate place in the creed, but also privately at every mention of Christ's name. Meanwhile, of course, she worked at her lessons with unflagging zeal, for it was by no means her intention to throw the whole onus of her success on the divine shoulders. She overworked, and on one occasion had a distressing lapse of memory. And at length spring was gone, and summer come, and the momentous week arrived on which her future depended. Now, though, she was not alone in her trepidation. The eyes of even the surest members of the form had a steely glint in them, and mouths were hard. Dr. Pewson's papers were said to be far more formidable than the public examination. If you got happily through these, you were safe. Six subjects were compulsory. High steppers took nine. Laura was one of those with eight. And since her two obligatory mathematics were not to be relied on, she could not afford to fail in a single subject. In the beginning, things, with the ex exception of numbers, went pretty well with her. Then came the final day, and with it the examination in history. Up to the present year Laura had cut a dash in history, now her brain was muddled, her memory overtaxed by her having to had to cram the whole of Green's history of the English people in a few months, beside a large dose of Greece and Rome. Reports ran of the exceptionally catchy nature of Dr. Pewson's questions, and Laura's prayer the night before was more like a threat than a supplication. The class had only just entered the headmaster's room on the eventful morning and begun to choose desks, when there came a summons to Laura to take a music lesson. This was outside consideration, and Dr. Pewson made short work of the intruder, a red-haired little girl who blushed meekly and unbecomingly and withdrew. Here, however, Laura rose and declared that, under these circumstances, some explanation was due to Monsieur Boma, the music master, today's lesson being in fact a rehearsal for the annual concert. Dr. Pewson raised his red-rimmed eyes from his desk and looked very fierce. He snapped in genial Irish, Irish fashion that made him dreaded and adored. How like a woman that is! Playing at concerts when she can't add two and two together! Your arithmetic paper's fit for punch, Miss Rambotham! The smile he looked for went round. Have you seen the questions? No. We'll give them here, then. You've got to go, I suppose, or we might deprive the concert of your shining light. Hurry back now. Stir your stumps. But this Laura had no intention of doing. In handling the printed slip, her eye lagging had caught the last and most vital question. Give a full account of Oliver Cromwell's for foreign policy. And she did not know it. She dragged out her interview with the music master, put questions wide of the point, insisted on lingering till he had arranged another hour for the postponed rehearsal, and as she walked she talked, and as she listened to Monsieur Boma's ridiculous English, she strove in vain to recall jot or tittle of Oliver's relations to foreign powers. Oh, for just a peep at the particular page of green! For, if once she got her cue, she believed she could go on. The dining hall was empty when she went through it on her way back to the classroom. Her history looked lovingly from its place on her shelf, but she did not dare to go over to it and take it out, and turn to the passage. That was too risky. 
What she did do, however, when she had almost reached the, the door, was to dash back, pull out a synopsis, a slender, medium-sized volume, and hastily and clumsily button this inside the bod bodice of her dress. The square, board-like appearance ga it gave her figure, where it projected beyond the sides of her apron, she concealed by hunching her shoulders. Her lightning plan was to enter a cloakroom, snatch a hurried peep at Oliver's confounded policy, then hide the book somewhere till the examination was over. But on emerging from the dining hall, she all but collided with the secretary, who had come noiselessly across the veranda, and she was so overcome by the thought of danger she had to run, and by Miss Blount's extreme surprise at Dr. Pewson's leniency, she allowed herself to be driven back to the examination room without a word. The girls were hard at it. They scarcely glanced up when she opened the door. From her friend's looks she could judge the success they were having. Cupid, for instance, was smirking to herself in the particular fashion that meant satisfaction. M.P.'s cheeks were the colour of monthly roses, and soon Laura, crouching low to cover her deformity, was at work like the rest. Had only Oliver Cromwell never been born, thus she reflected when she had got the easier part of the paper behind her. Why could it not have been a question about Burke and Wills, or the Eureka Stockade, or the voyages of Captain Cook? Something about one's own country that one had heard hundreds of times and was really interested in or a big arresting thing like the Retreat of the Ten Thousand, or Hannibal's March over the Alps. Who cared for old Oliver and his shorn head and his contempt for baubles? What did it matter now to anyone what his attitude had been more than two hundred years ago to all those far-away dream-like countries? Desperately she pressed her hand to her eyes. She knew the very page of green on which Oliver's foreign relations were set forth, she knew where the paragraph began, near the foot of the page. What she could not get hold of was the opening sentence that would have set her mechanical memory a-rolling. The two hours drew steadily to a close. About half an hour beforehand, the weakest candidates began to rise, to hand in their papers and leave the room. But it was not till ten minutes to twelve that the crack girl stopped writing. Laura was to be allowed an extra twenty minutes, and it was on this she relied. At last she was alone with the master. But though he was already dipping into the examination papers, he was not safe. She had unbuttoned two buttons, and was at a third, when he looked up so unexpectedly that she was scared out of her senses, and fastened her dress again with all the haste she could. Three or four of the precious minutes were lost. At this point the door opened, and Mr. Strachey strode into the room. Dr. Pewson blinked up from the stacks of papers, rose, and the two spoke in low tones. Then, with a glance at Laura, they went together to the door, with Dr. Pewson held be to behind him, and stood just over the threshold. As they warmed to their talk, the master let the door slip into the latch. Laura could see them from where she sat, without being seen. A moment later they moved stealthily away, going down the veranda in the direction of the office. Now for it! She, with palsied hands she undid her bodice, clutched at the book, forced her blurred eyes to find the page, and ran them over it. A brief survey, five or six heads to remember a few dates. Flapped to again, tucked her ape, under her apron, shoved into her bosom. And not a second too soon. There he came, hurrying back, and three buttons were still undone. But Laura's head was bent over her desk, though her heart was pummeling her ribs. Her pen now ran like lightning, and by the time the order to stop was given, she had covered the requisite number of sheets. Afterwards she had adroitly to rid herself of the book, then to take part, a rather pale-eyed, distracted part, in the lively technical discussion that ensued, when each candidate was as long-winded on the theme of her success or non-success as a card-player on his hand at the end of a round. Directly she could make good her escape, she planned a headache, climbed to her bedroom, and stretched herself flat on her bed. She was through, but at what cost? She felt quite sore. Her very bones seemed to hurt her. Not till she was thoroughly rested, and till she had assured herself that all risk attached to the incident was over, did she come to reflect on the part God had played in the business. And then, it must be admitted, she found it a sorry one. Just at first, indeed, her limpid faith was shocked into a reluctance to believe that he had helped her at all. His manner of doing it would have been so in inexpressibly mean. But little by little she dug deeper, and eventually she reached the conclusion 
that he had given her the option of this way, throwing it open to her, and then standing back and watching to see what she would do, without so much as raising an eyelid to influence her decision. In fact, the more she pondered over it, the more inclined she grew to think that it had been a kind of snare on the part of God, to trap her afresh into sin, and thus to prolong her dependence on him after her crying need was past. But if this was true, if he had done this, then he must like people to remain miserable sinners, so that he might have them always crawling to his feet. And from this view of the case her ingenious young mind shrank appalled. She could not go on loving and worshipping a god who was capable of double dealing, who could behave in such a mean, dewy fashion, nor would she ever forget his having forced her to endure the moments of torture she had come through that day. Lying on her bed she grappled with these thoughts. A feeling of deep resentment was their abiding result. Whatever his aim, it had been past expression pitiless of him, him who had at his command thousands of pleasanter ways in which to help her, thus to drive a poor unhappy girl to extremities, one, two, whose petition had not been prompted by selfish ends alone. What she had implored of him touched mother even more nearly than herself. Her part prayer to him had been to save mother, whose happiness depended on things like examinations, from a bitter disappointment. That much at least he had done. She would give him his due, but at the expense of her entire self-respect. Oh, he must have a cold, calculating heart. One could only see right down to it. The tale of his clemency and compassion which the Bible told were not to be interpreted literally when one came to think of it. Had he ever, outside the Bible, been known to stoop from his judgment seat and lovingly and kindly intervene? It was her own absurd mistake. She had taken the promises made through his son for gospel truth, and had thought he really meant what he said about rewarding those who were faithful to him. Her companions, the companions on whom, from the heights of her piety, she had looked pityingly down, were wiser than she. They did not abase themselves before him, and vow lifelong devotion, but neither did they make any but the most approved demands on him. They satisfied their consciences by paying him lip homage, by confessing their sins, and by asking for a vague, far distant mercy, to which they attached no great importance. Hence they never came into fierce personal conflict with him, nor would she ever again, from this time forward, she would rival the rest in lukewarmness. But before she could put this resolve into force, she had to let her first indignation subside. Only then was it possible for her to recover the shattering of her faith and settle down to practice religion after the glib and shallow mode of her friends. She did not, however, say her prayers that night, or for many a night to come, and, when at church Christ's name occurred in the service, she held her head erect, and shut the ears and eyes of her soul. Chapter 25 Ihr lentet alle nicht tanzen, wie man tanzen muss, über juch hinweg tanzen, Nietzsche. The school year had ebbed, the ceremonies that attended its conclusion were over. A few days beforehand the fifth form boarders, under the tutelage of a couple of governesses, drove off early in the morning to the distant university. On the outward journey the candidates were thoughtful and subdued. But as they returned home in the late afternoon, their spirits were not to be kept within seemly bounds. They laughed, sang, and rollicked about inside the wagonette. Miss Zielinski, weakly protesting unheard, was so rowdy that the driver pushed his cigar stump to the corner of his mouth to be able to smile at ease, and flicked his old horse into a canter. For the public examination had proved as anticipated child's play, compared with what the class had been through at Dr. Pewson's hands and its accompanying details were of an agreeable nature. The weather was too hot. The examination hall was light and airy. Through the flung-back windows, trees and flowering shrubs looked in. The students were watched over by a handsome Trinity man who laid his straw hat on the desk before him. Then came the annual concert, at which none of the performers broke down. Speech day, when the body of a big hall was crowded with relatives and friends, and when so many white, blue ribboned frocks were massed together on the platform that this looked like a great bed of blue and white flowers, and finally trunks were brought out from box rooms and strewn throughout the floors, and upper-form girls emptied cupboards and drawers into them for the last time. 
On the evening before the general dispersion, Laura, Cupid and M.P. walked the well-known paths of the garden once again. While the two elder girls were more loquacious than their wont, Laura was quieter. She had never wholly recovered her humour since the day of the history examination, and she still could not look back with composure on the jeopardy with which she had placed herself. One little turn of the wheel in the wrong direction, and the end of her school days would have been shame and disgrace. And just as her discovery of God's stratagem had dampened her religious ardour, so had her antipathy to the means she had been obliged to employ had left a feeling of enmity in her towards the school and everything connected with it. She had counted the hours till she could turn her back on it altogether. None the less, now that the time had come, there was a kind of ache at her having to say good-bye, for it was in her nature to let go unwillingly of things, places and people once known. Besides, glad as she felt to have it done with learning, she was unclear what was to come next. The idea of life at home attracted her as little as ever. Mother had even begun to hint as well that she would now be expected to instruct her young brothers. Hence her parting was affected with very mixed feelings. She did not know in the least where she really belonged, or under what conditions she would be happy. She was conscious only of a mild sorrow at having to take leave of the shelter of years. Her two companions had no such doubts and regrets. For them the past was already dead and gone, and their talk was all of the future, soon to become the present. They forecast this, mapping out it out for themselves with the iron belief in their power to do so, which is the hallmark of youth. Laura, walking at their side, listened to their words with the deepest interest, and with reverence she had learned to extend all opinions save her own. M.P. proposed to return to Melbourne at the end of the vacation, for she was going on to Trinity, where she intended to take one degree after another. She hesitated only whether it was to be in medicine or arts. "'Ooh, to cut off people's legs!' ejaculated Laura. "'M.P., how awful!' Oh, one soon gets used to that, child, but I think, on the whole, I should prefer to take up teaching. Then I shall probably be able to have a school of my own some day. I shouldn't wonder if you got Sandy's place here, said Laura, who was assured that MP's massy intellect would open all doors. Who knows, answered Mary, and set her lips in a determined fashion of her own. Stranger things have happened. Cupid, less enamoured of her continual discipline, intended to be a writer. My cousin says I've got the stuff in me, and he's a journalist and ought to know. I should rather think he ought. Well, I mean to have a shot at it. And you, Laura? M.P. asked suavely. Me? Oh, goodness knows. Close as usual, infant. No, really not, Cupid. Well, you'll soon have to make up your mind to something now. You're nearly sixteen. Why not go on working for your B.A.? No, thanks. I've had enough of that here and Laura's thoughts waved their hands, as it were, to the receding figure of Oliver Cromwell. Be a teacher, then. MP, I never want to hear a date or add up a column of figures again. Laura! It's the solemn truth. I'm fed up with those blessed things. Fancy not having a single wish. Wish? I've tons of wishes. First I want to be with Evie again, and then I want to see things. Yes, most of all... Hundreds and thousands of things, people and places and what they eat and how they dress, and China and, and Japan, just tons. Hmm, you'll have to hook a millionaire for that, my dear. And perhaps you'll write a book about your travels for us stay-at-homes. Gracious, I shouldn't know how to begin. But you'll send me all your books, won't you, Cupid? And MP, you'll let me come and see you get your degrees, every single one. With these and similar promises, the three girls parted. They never met again. For a time they exchanged letters regularly, many sheeted letters full of familiar personal detail. Then the detail ceased, the pages grew fewer in number, the time gap longer. Letters in turn gave place to mere notes and postcards scribbled in violent haste at wide intervals, and ultimately even these ceased, and the great silence of separation was unbroken. Nor were the promises redeemed. There came to Laura neither gifts nor books nor calls to be present at academic robings. Within six months of leaving school, M.P. married and settled down in her native township, and thereafter she was forced to adjust the rate of her progress to the steps of halting little feet. Cupid went a governessing and spent the best years of her life in the obscurity of the bush. And Laura, 
in Laura's case, no kindly atropos snipped the thread of her aspirations. These large, vague, extemporary, one and all achieved fulfilment, then withered off to make room for more. But this, the future still securely hid from her. She went out from school with the uncomfortable sense of being a square peg which fitted into none of the round holes of her world. The wisdom she had got, the experience she was richer by, had, in the process of equipping her for life, merely seemed to disclose her unfitness. She could not then know, that even for the squarest peg, the right hole may ultimately be found. Seeming unfitness proved to be only another aspect of a peculiar and particular and special fitness. But of the after years and what they brought her, it's not to purport of this little book to tell. It is enough to say many a day came and went before she grasped that, oftentimes, just those mortals who feel cramped and unsure in the conduct of everyday life will find themselves to rights with astounding ease in that freer, more spacious world where no practical considerations hamper and where creatures that inhabit dance to their tune, the world where stored up men's best thoughts, the hopes, the fancies, where the shadow is the substance, and the multitude of business pales before the dream. In the meantime, however, the exodus of the fifty-five turned the college upside down. Early the following morning, Laura made her final preparations for departure. This, alas, was not to be on so imposing a scale as the departure of her schoolfellows, they, under special escort, would have a cab apiece, and would drive off with flying handkerchiefs, and all their luggage piled high in front. Whereas Laura's box had gone by van, for she and Pin, who was in Melbourne on a visit, were to spend a couple of days at Godmother's before starting up country. Even her farewells, which she had often rehearsed to herself with dramatic emphasis, went off without eclat, except for Miss Chapman, the governesses were absent when the moment came and Miss Chapman's mind was so full of other things that she went on giving orders while she was shaking hands. But Laura was not destined to leave the walls, within the shadow of which she had learned so much, as tamely as all this, there was still a surprise waiting for her. As she whisked about the corridors in search of Mrs. Gurley, she met two girls, one of whom said, "'I say, Laura Rambotham, you're fetched. Your pretty sister's come for you.' "'My—' "'Who?' gaped Laura. "'Your sister, by gum, there's a nose for you, and those whopping eyes. You'll have to play second fiddle to that all your days, my dear.' On entering the reception room, Laura tried hard to see Pin with the eyes of a stranger. Pin rose from her chair, awkwardly, of course, for there were other people present, and Laura's violent stare was disconcerting in the extreme. It made Pin believe her hat was crooked, or that she had a black speck on her nose. As for Laura, she could see no great change in her sister. The freckles were certainly paler, the features were perhaps beginning to emerge a little from the cushiony fat in which they were bedded, but that was all. Still, if outsiders, girls in particular, were struck by it. A keener stab than this, really she did not grudge Pin being pretty. It was only the newness of the thing that hurt. A keener stab was it that, Though she had ordered Pin repeatedly, and with all the stress she was master of, to come in a wagonette to fetch her, so that she might at least drive away like the other girls, in spite of this the little nincompoop had arrived on foot. Godmother had said the idea of driving was stuff and nonsense, and quite unnecessary expense. Pin, of course, had meekly given in, and thus Laura's last brave attempt to be comfortably like her companions came to naught. She went out of the school in the same odd and undignified fashion in which she had lived there. The wrangle caused by Pin's chicken-heartedness lasted the sisters down the garden path, across the road and over into the precincts of a large public path. Only when they were some distance through this did Laura wake to what was happening to her. Then it came over her with a rush. She was free. Absolutely free. She might do any mortal thing she chose. As a beginning she stopped short. "'Hold on, Pin, take this,' she said, giving her sister the heavy leather bag they were carrying in terms to the tramway. Pin obediently held out her hand in its little white cotton glove. "'And my hat. What are you going to do, Laura? You'll see. You'll get sunstroke. Fiddles, it's quite shady. Here are my gloves. Now, Pin, you follow your nose and you'll find me where you find me.' "'Oh, what are you going to do, Laura?' cried Pin in anxiety. I'm going to have a good run, said Laura, and tightened her hair ribbon. 
Oh, but you can't run in the street. You're too big. People will see you. Think I care? If you'd been years only doing what you were allowed to do, I guess you'd want to do something you weren't allowed to do, too. Goodbye. She was off, had darted away into the leaden heat of the December morning like an arrow from its bow. Her head bent, her arms up close to her side, fleet-footed as a spaniel. Pin was faced by the swift and rhythmic upturning of her heels. There were not many people abroad at this early hour, but the few there were stood still and looked in amazement after the half-grown girl in white, whose thick black plait of hair soared up and down as she ran. And a man with a mop and bucket who was watching, washing statues stopped his work and whistled and winked at Pin as she passed. Cross and confused, Pin trudged after her sister, Laura's hat and gloves in one hand, the leather bag in the other. Right down the central avenue ran Laura, growing smaller and smaller in the distance, the area of her movements decreasing as she ran, till she appeared to be almost motionless, and not much larger than a figure in the background of a picture. Then came a sudden bend in the long, straight path. She shot round it, and was lost to sight. You could also rely on her to do a dirty job for you. A horrid little toady was the verdict, especially of those who had no objection to be toadied to. Torn thus between mutinous sentiments on the one hand, a longing for restitution on the other, Laura grew very sly, a regular little tactician. In these days she was for ever considering what she ought to do, what to leave undone. She learnt to weigh her words before uttering them, instead of blurting out her thoughts, in the childish fashion that had exposed her to ridicule. She learnt, too, at last, to keep her real opinions to herself, and to make those she expressed tally with her hearers. And she was quick to discover that this was a shortcut towards regaining her lost place, to conceal what she truly felt, particularly if her feelings ran counter to those of the majority. For, the longer she was at school, the more insistently the truth was driven home to her, that the majority is always in the right. In the shifting of classes that took place at the year's end, she left the three chief witnesses of her disgrace, Tilly, Maria, Kate, behind her. She was again among a new set of girls. But this little piece of luck was outweighed by the fact that, shortly after Christmas, her room was changed for the one occupied by M.P. and M.P.'s best friend. So far, Laura had hardly dared to lift her eyes in Mary Pidwall's presence. For Mary knew not only the sum of her lies, but also held, or so Laura believed, that she came of a thoroughly degenerate family, thanks to Uncle Tom and the early weeks spent at close quarters with her bore out these fears. The looks both M.P. and her friend bent on Laura said as plainly as words, If we are forced to tolerate this obnoxious little insect about us, we can at least show it just what a horrid little beast it is. M.P. in particular was adamant, unrelenting. Laura quailed at the sound of her step. And yet she soon felt, rightly enough, it was just in the winning over of this stern, rigid nature that her hope of salvation lay. If she could once get M.P. on her side, all might yet be well again. So she began to lay siege to Mary's good will, to Mary, who took none but the barest notice of her, even in the bedroom ignoring her as if she did not exist, and giving the necessary orders, for she was the eldest of the three, in tones of ice but it needed a great wariness on Laura's part, and, in the beginning, she made a mistake. She was a toad-eater here, too, seeking to curry favour with M.P., as with the rest, by fawning on her, in a way for which she could afterwards have hit herself. For it did not answer. M.P. had only a double disdain for the cringer, knowing nothing herself of the pitfalls that lie in wait for a temperament like Laura's. Mary's friendship was extended to none but those who had a lofty moral standard, and truthfulness and honesty were naturally the head virtues on her list. Laura was sharp enough to see that, if she wished to gain ground with M.P., she must make a radical change in her tactics. It was not enough, where Mary was in question, to play the echo. 
did she, Laura, state an opinion, she must say what she meant, above all, mean what she said, and stick manfully to it, instead of, at the least hint, being ready to fly over to Mary's point of view. Always, though, of course, with a disquieting proviso in the background, that her own opinions were such as she ought to have, and not heretical leanings that shocked and dismayed. In which case, there was nothing for it but to go on being mum. She ventured, moreover, little unobtrusive services, to which she thought neither of the girls could take exception, making their beds for them in the morning, and staying up last at night to put out the light. And once she overheard the friend, who was called Cupid, say, "'You know, M.P., she's not such a bad little stick, after all.' But then Cupid was easy-going, and inclined to be original. Mary answered, "'She's no doubt beginning to see that she can't lie to us, but she's a very double-faced child.' It was also with an eye to M.P.'s approval that Laura threw herself, with renewed zeal, upon her work, and in those classes that called only for the exercise of her memory she soon sat high. The reason why she could not mount still higher was that M.P. occupied the top place, and was not to be moved, even had Laura dreamed of attempting it. And at length, after three months of unremitting exertion, in the course of which, because she had little peeps of what looked like success, the rebel in her went to sleep again. At length Laura had her reward. One Sunday morning M.P. asked her to be her partner on the walk to church. This was as if a great poet should bend from his throne to take a younger brother-singer by the hand, and, in her headlong fashion, Laura all but fell at the elder girl's feet. From this day forward she out-heroded Herod, in her attempts to make of herself exactly what Mary thought she ought to be. Deep within her, none the less, there lurked a feeling which sometimes made as if to raise its head, a feeling that she did not really like M.P., or admire her, or respect her, one which, had it come quite to life, would have kicked against Mary's authority, been contemptuous of her unimaginative way of seeing and saying things, on the alert to remind its owner that her way, too, had a right to existence. But it was not strong enough to make itself heard, or rather Laura refused to hear it, and turned a deaf ear whenever it tried to hint at its presence. For Mr. Worldly Wiseman was her model just now. Whereas Cupid? There was something in Cupid that was congenial to her. A plain girl, with irregular features, how she had come by her nickname no one knew. Cupid was three years older than Laura, and one of the few in the school who loved reading for its own sake. In a manner she was cleverer even than M.P., but it was not a school-booky way, and hence was not thought much of. However, Laura felt drawn to her at once, even though Cupid treated her as quite a little girl, and they sometimes got as far as talking of books they had read. From this whiff of her, Laura was sure that Cupid would have had more understanding than M.P. for her want of veracity, for Cupid had a kind of daredevil mind in a hidebound character, and was often very bold of speech. Yet it was not Cupid's good opinion she worked for with might and main. The rate of her upward progress in Mary's estimation could be gauged by the fact that the day came when the older girl spoke openly to her of her crime. At the first merciless words, Laura winced hotly, both at and for the tactlessness of which Mary was guilty. But the first shameful stab over, she felt the better of it. Yes, it was a relief to speak to someone of what she had borne alone for so long. To speak of it, and even to argue around it a little, for, like most wrongdoers, Laura soon acquired a taste for dwelling on her misdeed and Mary, being entirely without humour, and also unversed in dealing with criminals, did not divine that this was just a form of self-indulgence. It was Cupid who said, "'Look here, infant, you'll be getting cocky about what you did if you don't look out.' Mary would not allow that a single one of Laura's excuses held water. "'That's the sheerest nonsense. 
you don't seem to realize that you tried to defame another person's moral character, she said, in the assured, superior way that so impressed Laura. And this aspect of the case, which had never once occurred to her, left Laura open-mouthed, and yet a little doubtful. Mr. Shepherd was surely too far above her, and too safely ensconced in holiness, to be injured by anything she might say. But the idea gave her food for thought, and she even tentatively developed her story along these unfamiliar lines, just to see how it might have turned out. One night, as they were undressing for bed, Mary spoke, with the same fireless deprecation, of the behaviour of a classmate which had been brought to her notice that day. This girl was said to have nefariously copied from another, in the course of a written examination, and, as prefect of her class, Mary was bound to track the evil down. I shall make them both show me their papers, as soon as they get them back, and then, if I find proof of what's being said, I must tackle her. Just as I tackled you, Laura. Laura flushed. Oh, M.P., I've never copied in my life, she cried. Probably not. But those things all belong in the same box. Lying and copying and stealing. You never will believe me when I say I didn't know anything about that horrid chinky. I only told a few crams. That was quite different. I think it's most unfortunate, Laura, that you persist in clinging to that idea. Here M.P. was obliged to pause, for she had put a lock of hair between her teeth while she did something to a plait at the back. As soon as she could speak again, she went on. You and your few crams. Have you ever thought, pray, what a state of things it would be if we all went about telling falsehoods and saying it didn't matter, they were merely a few little fibs? What are you laughing at? I'm not laughing. I mean, I just smiled. I was only thinking how funny it would be. Sandy and old Gurley and Jim Chapman all going round making up things that had never happened. You've a queer notion of what's funny. Have you utterly no respect for the truth? Yes, of course I have. But I say, Laura, who always slipped quickly out of her clothes, was sitting in her nightgown on the edge of the bed, hugging her knees. I say, M.P., if everybody told stories, and if everybody knew everybody else was telling them, then truth wouldn't be any good any more, would it? If nobody used it. What rubbish you do talk, said Mary serenely, as she shook her toothbrush on to a towel and rubbed it dry. As if truth were a soap, remarked Cupid, who was already in bed, reading Nana and trying to smoke a cigarette under the blankets. You can't do away with truth, child. But why not? Who says so? It isn't a law. Don't try to be so sharp, Laura. I didn't mean to, M.P., but what is truth, anyhow? asked Laura. The Bible is truth. Can you do away with the Bible, pray? Of course not. But, M.P., the Bible isn't quite all truth, you know. My father— Here she broke off in some confusion, remembering Uncle Tom. Well, what about him? You don't want to say, I hope, that he didn't believe in the Bible. Laura drove back the, of course not, that was all but over her lips. Well, not exactly, she said, and grew very red. But you know, M.P., whales don't have big enough throats ever to have swallowed Jonah. Little girls shouldn't talk about what they don't understand. The Bible is God's word, and God is truth. You're a silly infant, threw in Cupid, coughing as she spoke. Truth has got to be, and honesty too. If it didn't exist, there couldn't be any state, or laws, or any social life. It's one of the things that makes men different from animals, and the people who boss us know pretty well what they're about. You bet when they punish the ruffians who don't practice it. Yes, now that I see, agreed Laura eagerly. Then truth's a useful thing. Oh, and that's probably what it means, too, when you say, Honesty is the best policy. I never heard such a child, said M.P., shocked. Cupid, you really shouldn't put such things into her head. You're downright immoral, Laura. Oh, how can you say such a horrid thing? Well, your ideas are simply dreadful. 
you ought to try your hardest to improve them. I do, M.P., really I do. You don't succeed. I think there must be a screw loose in you somewhere. Anyhow, I vote we adjourn this meeting, said Cupid, recovering from a fresh cough and splutter. Or old Gurley will be coming in to put me on a mustard plaster. As for you, infant, if you take the advice of a chap who has seen life, you'll keep your ideas to yourself. They're too crude for this elegant world. Right you are, said Laura, cheerfully. She was waiting by the gas-jet till M.P. had folded her last garment, and she shuffled her bare feet one over the other as she stood, for it was a cold night. The light out, she hopped into bed, in the dark. CHAPTER Twenty One. But the true seal was set on her regeneration, when she was invited to join the Borders Literary Society, of which Cupid and Mary were the leading spirits. This carried her back, at one stroke, into the swing of school life. For everybody who was anybody belonged to the society, and, despite her friendship with the head of her class, Laura still knew what it was to get the cold shoulder. But this was to some extent her own fault. At the present stage of her career she was an extraordinarily prickly child, and even to her two sponsors did not at times present a very amiable outside. Like a hedgehog, she was ever ready to shoot out her spines. With regard, that is, to her veracity. She had been so badly grazed, in her recent encounter, that she was now constantly seeing doubt where no doubt was, and this wakeful attitude of suspicion towards others did not make for brotherly love. The amenity of her manners suffered, too. Though she kept to her original programme of not saying all she thought, yet what she was forced to say she blurted out in such a precise and blunt fashion that it made a disagreeable impression. At the same time a growing pedantry in trifles warped both her imagination and her sympathies, and to the Aegis of M.P. she rapidly learned to be the latter's rival in an adherence to bald fact, and in her contumely for those who departed from it. Indeed, before the year spent in Mary's company was out, Laura was well on the way towards becoming one of those uncomfortable people who, concerned only for their own salvation, fire the truth at you on every occasion, without regard for your tender places. So she remained but scantly popular. Hence her admission to the literary society augured well. Her chief qualifications for membership were that she could make verses, and was also very fond of reading. At school, however, this taste had been quiescent, for books were few. Still, she had read whatever she could lay hands on, and for the past half year or more she had fared like a little pig in a clover field. Since Christmas she was one of the few permitted to do morning practice on the grand piano in Mrs. Strachey's drawing-room, an honour, it is true, not overmuch valued by its recipients, for Mrs. Gurley's bedroom lay just above, and that lady could swoop down on whoever was weak enough to take a little rest. But Laura snapped her fingers at such a flimsy objection, for this was the wonderful room, round the walls of which low, open bookshelves ran, and she was soon bold enough, on entering, hastily to select a book to read while she played, always on the alert to pop it behind her music, should any one come into the room. For months she browsed unchecked. As her choice had to be made with extreme celerity, and from those shelves nearest the piano, it was in the nature of things that it was not invariably a happy one. For some time she had but moderate luck, and sampled queer foods. To these must be reckoned a translation of Faust, which she read through, to the end of the first part at least, with a kind of dreary wonder why such a dull thing should be called great. For her next repast she sought hard, and it was in the course of this rummage that she had the strangest find of all. Running a skilled eye over the length of a shelf close at hand, she hit on a slim blue volume, the title of which at once arrested her attention. For, notwithstanding her fourteen years, and her dabblings in Richardson and Scott, Laura's liking for a real child's book was as strong as it had ever been and a doll's house seemed to promise good things. 
deftly extracting the volume, she struck up her scales and began to read. This was the day on which, after breakfast, Mrs. Gurley pulverized her with the remark, A new, and I must say, extremely interesting fashion of playing scales, Laura Rambotham, to hold the forte pedal down from beginning to end. Laura was unconscious of having sinned in this way, but it might quite well be so, for she had spent a topsy-turvy, though highly engrossing, hour. In place of the children's story she anticipated, she had found herself, on opening the book, confronted by the queerest stuff she had ever seen in print, from the opening sentence on. To begin with, it was a play, and Laura had never had a modern prose play in her hand before. And then it was all about the oddest, yet the most commonplace people. It seemed to her amazingly unreal, how these people spoke and behaved. She had never known anyone like them, and yet again so true in the way it dragged in everyday happenings, so petty in its rendering of petty things, that it bewildered and repelled her. Why, someone might just as well write a book about Mother or Sarah. Her young romantic soul rose in arms against this, its first bluff contact with realism, against such a dispiriting sobriety of outlook. Something within her wanted to cry out in protest as she read, for read she did, on three successive days, with an interest she could not explain. And that was not all. It was worse that the people in this book, the extraordinary person who was married, and had children, and yet ate biscuits out of a bag, and said she didn't, the man who called her his lark and his squirrel, as if any man did call his wife such names. All these people seemed eternally to be meaning something different from what they said, something that was forever eluding her. It was most irritating. There was, moreover, no mention of a doll's house in the whole three acts. The state of confusion this booklet left her in she allayed with a little old brown leather volume of Longfellow, and Hyperion was so much more to her liking that she even ventured to borrow it from its place on the shelf in order to read it at her leisure, braving the chance that her loan, were it discovered, might be counted against her as a theft. It hung together, no doubt, with the after-effects of her dip into Ibsen, that on her sitting down to write the work that was to form her passport to the society, her mind should incline to the most romantic of romantic themes. Not altogether, though. Laura's taste, such as it was, for literature, had, like all young people's, a mighty bias towards those books which turned their backs on reality. She sought not truth, but the miracle. However, though she had thus taken sides, there was still a yawning gap to be bridged between her ready acceptance of the honourable invitation and the composition of a masterpiece. Thanks to her unwanted inability to project her thoughts beyond the moment, she had been so unthinking of possible failure that Cupid had found it necessary to interject. Here, I say, don't blow. Whereas, when she came to write, she sat with her pen poised over the paper for nearly half an hour, without bringing forth a word. First there was the question of form. She considered, then abruptly dismissed, the idea of writing verses the rhymes with love and dove, and heart and part, which could have been managed, were, she felt, too silly and sentimental to be laid before her quizzical audience. Next, what to write about, a simple theme, such as a fairy tale, was not for a moment to be contemplated. No, Laura had always flown her hawk high, and she was now bent on making a splutter. It ended up by being a toss-up between a play in the Shakespearean manner and a novel after Scott. She decided on the novel. It should be a romance of Venice, with abundant murder and mystery in it, and a black, black villain, such as her soul loved, no macaroon nibblers or rumpers with children for her. And having thus attuned her mind to scarlet deeds, she set to work. But she found it tremendously difficult to pin her story to paper. She saw things clearly enough and could have related them by word of mouth, but did she try to write them down they ran to mist, and though she toiled quite literally in the sweat of her brow, yet when the eventful day came 
she had but three niggardly pages to show for her pains. About twenty girls formed the society, which assembled one Saturday evening in an empty music-room. All were not, of course, equally productive. Some had brought it no further than a riddle, and it was just these drones who, knowing nothing of the pother composition implied, criticised most stringently the efforts of the rest. Several members had pretty enough talents, Laura's two roommates among the number. On the night Laura made her debut, the weightiest achievement was, without doubt, M.P.'s essay on magnanimity, and Laura's eyes grew moist as she listened to its stirring phrases. Next best, to her thinking at least, was a humorous episode by Cupid, who had a gift that threw Laura into a fit of amaze, and this was the ability to expand infinitely little into infinitely much, to rig out a trifle in many words, so that in the end it seemed ever so much bigger than it really was, just as a thrifty merchant boils his oranges to swell them to twice their size. Laura being the youngest member, her affair came last on the programme. She had to sit and listen to the others, her cheeks hot, her hands very cold. Presently all were done, and then Cupid, who was chairman, called on a new author, Rambotham, who it is hoped will prove a valuable acquisition to the society, to read us his maiden effort. Laura rose to her feet, and trembling with nervousness, stuttered forth her prose. The three little pages shot by like a flash. She had barely stood up before she was obliged to sit down again, leaving her hearers, who had only just readopted their listening attitudes, agape with astonishment. She could have endured with phlegm the ridicule this malheur earned her. What was hard of the stomach was that her paper heroics made utterly no impression. She suffered all the humiliation of a flabby fiasco, and, till bedtime, shrank out of her friend's way. "'You were warned to be not too cocky, you know,' Mary said judicially, on seeing her downcast air. "'I didn't mean to be, really. Then you don't think what I wrote was up to much, M.P.' Hmm," said the elder girl, in a non-committal way. Here Cupid chimed in. "'Look here, infant, I want to ask you something. Have you ever been in Venice?' "'No. Ever seen a gondola?' "'No. Or the Doge's Palace? Or a black-cloaked assassin? Or a masked lady?' "'You know I haven't,' murmured Laura, humbled to the dust. "'And probably never will. Well, then, why on earth try to write wooden second-hand rubbish like that? Second-hand? But Cupid, think of Scott. He couldn't have seen half he told about. My goodness, ejaculated Cupid, and sat down and fanned herself with a hairbrush. You don't imagine you're a Scott, do you? Here, hold me, MP, I'm going to faint. And at Laura's quick and scarlet denial she added, Well, why the unmentionable not to use the eyes the Lord has given you, and write about what's before them every day of your life? Do you think that would be better? I don't think. I know it would. But Laura was not so easily convinced as all that. Ever a talented imitator, she next tried her hand at an essay on an abstract subject. This was a failure. You could not see things when you wrote about, say, beneficence, and Laura's thinking was done mainly in pictures. Matters were still worse when she tinkered at Cupid's especial genre. Her worthless little incident stared at, naked and scraggy, from the sheet. She had no wealth of words at her disposal, in which to deck it out. So, with a sigh, she turned back to the advice Cupid had given her, and prepared to make a faithful transcript of actuality. She called what she now wrote, A Day at School and conscientiously set down detail on detail, so fearful this time of over-brevity that she spun the account out to twenty pages, though the writing of it was as distasteful to her as her reading of a doll's house had been. At the subsequent meeting of the society, expression of opinion was not lacking. "'Oh, Jehoshaphat, how much more! Here, let me get out! I've had enough! I say, you forgot to count how many steps it took you to come downstairs!' till the chairman had pity on the embarrassed author, and said, "'Look here, Laura, I think you'd better keep the rest for another time.' 
It was just what you told me to do. Laura reproached Cupid that night. She was on the brink of tears. But Cupid was disinclined to shoulder the responsibility. Told you to be as dull and long-winded as that? Infant, it's a whacker! But it was true what I wrote, every word of it. Neither of the two elder girls was prepared to discuss this vital point. Cupid shifted ground. Good Lord, Laura, but it's hard to drive a thing into your brain-pan. You don't need to be all true on paper, silly child. Last time you said I had to. Well, if you want it, my candid opinion is that you haven't any talent for this kind of thing. Now turn off the gas. As the light in the room went out, a kind of inner light seemed to go up in Laura, and both then and on the following days she thought hard. She was very ambitious, anxious to shine, not ready to accept defeat. And to the next literary contest she bought the description of an excursion to the hills and gullies that surrounded Warrenega, into which she had worked an adventure with some vagrant blacks. She and Pin and the boys had often picnicked on these hills, with their lunches packed in billies, and she had seen the caves and rocky holes where blackfellows were said to have hidden themselves in early times. But neither this particular excursion, nor the exciting incident which she described with all the aplomb of an eyewitness, had ever taken place. That is to say, not a word of her narration was true, but every word of it might have been true. And with this she had an unqualified success. I believe there's something in you after all, said Cupid to her that night. Anyway, you know now what it is to be true, yet not dull and prosy. And Laura manfully choked back her desire to cry out that not a word of her story was fact. She was long in falling asleep. Naturally, she was elated and excited by her success. But also, a new and odd piece of knowledge had niched itself in her brain. It was this. In your speech, your talk with others, you must be exact to the point of pedantry, and never romance or draw the longbow, or you would be branded as an abominable liar. Whereas, as soon as you put pen to paper, provided you kept one foot planted on probability, you might lie as hard as you liked. Indeed, the more vigorously you lied, the louder would be your hearer's applause. And Laura fell asleep over a chuckle.